Hello, my name is James Daru, and I'm a proud member of the museum's Board of Trustees and also co-chair for this year's virtual Bull and Oyster Roast. As an employee of KCI Technologies, a 100% employee-owned engineering consulting company headquartered right here in Maryland, we are proud to be the entertainment sponsor for this year's event. KCI has a long history of supporting the museum industry, including the recent Crane campaign. But we have supported the Bull Roast every year since it started. In fact, KCI's own Harvey Floyd who recently retired after 35 years of service to our firm, is credited with growing the event into what it is today. Anyone that knows Harvey will tell you that he loves a good party. Harvey's support and enthusiasm towards this event and the dedication and efforts of the museum staff combine to make this a sellout event every year for the past 10 years. In fact, Harvey introduced the museum team to the band, The Classic Case, and secured KCI's entertainment sponsor several years in a row. Please join me in congratulating Harvey on his recent retirement. Don't worry, Harvey. We will have the table closest to the band again next year. Good evening. I'm Nan Rohr, board chair of the Baltimore Museum of Industry, and I am thrilled to be here with you tonight for our annual bull and oyster roast. The BMI is dedicated to preserving our region's industrial past and also to connecting visitors to what is happening in industry today. Our mission has taken on new meaning and certainly a sense of urgency as the ongoing pandemic has impacted so many facets of work life. We are especially proud of our commitment to highlighting the men and women who are contributing to Maryland's economic growth by reimagining traditional industries. We are looking forward to sharing some of their stories with you this evening. The Bull and Oyster Roast raises funds to support the BMI's innovative educational resources. We are so grateful to all of you who have already made donations and who have bid very generously in the auction and yes, bought raffle tickets. If you haven't already done so, don't worry, it's not too late. The auction is open until 8 p.m. and you can also purchase raffle tickets until then as well. You can find the links for all of the bidding, donating, and buying raffle tickets in the chat. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors who have stuck with us during this very unusual year. A big thank you to Len the Plumber, KCI Technologies, Pompeian, Talkoff Food Products, the Propeller Club of Baltimore, Nelson Coleman Jewelers, Direct Dimensions, the Novak Family, and Scott and Amy Enzor. I am excited now to turn the program over to our MC extraordinaire, Tom Hall. Many of you know Tom as the host of WYPR's Midday Show. Tom has been an extraordinary friend to the BMI for many years, and we are so very grateful to him for graciously giving his time to the BMI's 2021 Bull and Oyster Roast. Tom, take it away. And thank you, Nan. I really appreciate it. And I am delighted to be with everybody tonight and glad you are all joining us as well. Um, it is really a pleasure to be with you and celebrating uh, this fantastic institution, the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Obviously, uh, none of us need to be convinced of the great contribution that the BMI makes to our community. Um, it's important that we all keep in mind uh, how important the BMI is as the evening progresses, but the history that it tells, the stories that it tells, the contribution that it makes to the museum community, the arts community, and the community at large just can't be uh, overstated. So thanks to all of you for joining us, and thanks to everybody who had a hand in making tonight happen. Uh, I want to thank as well our event host sponsor, Nan mentioned them, but we want to mention them again. Len the Plumber, once again, has made this evening's event possible. Uh, they have demonstrated such a strong commitment to the educational programs of the BMI, so thanks to Len the Plumber. Uh, and of course, what would a BMI bull and oyster roast be without that fantastic music from a classic case? So I hope you all enjoyed listening to their music that got the party started. And uh, thanks also to the generous support 
of KCI Technologies. They're our entertainment sponsor, so we're very grateful to them as well. The theme of this year's event is history on a half shell. So you are in for a real treat. We've got many oyster related presentations for you tonight. So sit back, uh, hopefully with a plate full of oysters and a, an adult beverage or two, if you'd like, and let's get the party started. We're gonna begin at the source of all things oyster. We are gonna travel across the Bay Bridge to Kent Island. Founder and partner Scott Budden is going to give us a tour of his Orch Orchard Point Oyster Farm. Scott, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm Scott Budden. I'm a partner here at Orchard Point Oyster Company. Oysters have been harvested in Maryland ever since colonial times and even before that with indigenous peoples. It really hit its stride and boomed in the postbellum late 1800s all the way through the early 1900s. Uh, oysters were being harvested from the bay at you know huge volumes um, and it really took a toll on the populations. It was not sustainable. So people started thinking about okay how are we going to continue to harvest oysters from this rich and bountiful water back when they started seeing population declines in the 20s. And, you know, there was some thought given to oyster farming then, but it didn't really take off in Maryland for a lot of reasons. Um, some were political, some were economic, but in any event, it didn't really get much traction until actually a century later, in the early 2000s, when facing historically low oyster populations, people started to think, well, maybe we should give this a, th a shot. And in 2010, the legislature actually opened up the bay to leasing, uh, which is the type of aquaculture we practice here. And you can see with the cage gear, it's different than traditional oyster harvesting and that public fishery. So we sustainably raise and grow oysters in contained gear. Uh, we do this with bottom cages, you can see us handling on the boat, as well as surface floats where you can see us pulling bags. Um, this keeps the oysters in the same spot. Um, it allows us to control our crop for greater quality. And, you know, it's very sustainable in that as long as we get seed every year, we're able to continue to plant. We're not taking anything from the wild stocks or the public fishery, and we're only harvesting what we plant. So uh, it's very sustainable in that way. You can see us on the boat culling through oysters for harvest, as well as actually washing the oysters in a tumbler. This cleans the oysters, it sorts them by size, and it actually increases the density of the shell, which makes for a better product with plumper meat. I can also see us pulling bags out of surface floats, and that's to harvest the oysters. The reason we use surface floats is it actually tumbles the oysters constantly and creates a much better, higher quality product. We sell our Orchard Point oysters directly to some of the best chefs in the country, as well as through wholesalers. And ever since the pandemic started, we've been selling them directly to the public. All you gotta do is go to www.orchardpointoysters.com and check out our shuck shop. We feature our Orchard Point oysters, as well as a seaside oyster, and various other high quality premium seafood. And I hope you've enjoyed this farm tour and enjoy the rest of the bull and oyster roast. Cheers. And thank you, Scott, that's terrific. It's great to get that inside look to the terrific work that you guys do. Um, you know, after being stuck at home for so many months, um, I think we all enjoyed, you know, taking at least a virtual trip to the Eastern shore and seeing all the work that goes into harvesting oysters sustainably. Um, you know, like me, I'm sure that many of you uh, enjoy preparing oysters. But I'm guessing that not many of us know really what to do with a fresh oyster that's still in its shell. So lucky for us, Scott's also going to give us a shucking lesson. So let's uh, take a look at how to properly shuck these little guys. Hey, Scott Budden of Orchard Point Oyster Company. Welcome to BMI's Bone Oyster Roast shucking portion of the evening. 
So hopefully you were able to score yourself some fresh Orchard Point oysters straight out of the Chesapeake via the event email. But if not, hopefully you have some other fresh Chesapeake oysters in front of you. And what you want to do is go ahead and put those oysters in a bowl with some ice on top. Uh, that'll help get them chilled down and ready to eat. Uh, the next thing you want to do is grab yourself some local Maryland beer. I've got a nice St. Michael's Ale and Amber Ale from Eastern Shore Brewing Company. That's really nice. Clean, crisp, refreshing. It's going to go great with these oysters. So then you want to grab yourself a good knife. I've got a Dale German model Chesapeake Stab. So Dale is a local knife maker here in Baltimore. He makes these fabulous knives. Um, they're not too long, not too thick. They're perfect for going in the front and a really ergonomic, comfortable handle. So uh, you want to find yourself a nice working platform. I've got a cutting board on the table. You don't want it too high. You kind of want it a little bit low, below waist level so you can be on top. Instead of doing it too high, it's not that comfortable. Um, something stable that you can put some weight on, nice and flat. So then you want to take your oyster, and the oyster's got two sides. It's got a, a curved cup side and then a flat top side. And then it's got the front here, which is the bill or the, the bill where the gills are, and then it's got the rear or the hinge. So we're going to do it through the front using the stabber because that's how we do it here in Maryland and Chesapeake. Go ahead and place your oyster down on the flat surface, cup side down. Take a nice kitchen towel or one you don't mind actually getting dirty. doesn't have to be nice. And I'm left-handed, so if you're ready, you'll be backwards. But this is the most dangerous part when people get scared about chucking. It's when you actually enter the oyster. So go ahead and put that towel there. Take your knife and insert the tip and wiggle it in. That, that's how easy that was. That was the most dangerous part. And it's in. It's over. Now you take the oyster and you kind of want to slide that tip around to the front. I guess it's the front right side of the oyster if you're looking at it from the rear and the front left if it's from the front. Um, go ahead and slide that tip around and cut that bottom muscle. Bottom muscle, top muscle on that side of the oyster. Okay, it's cut, it's cut free. Take off any little bits of discarded shell. Go ahead and lift that flat or top part up. Take the tip of your knife and gently push and pull and cut the gills down. Like this, like so. There you go. Flick out any bits of shell you might have broken free. Tip your knife, make sure it's cut free, it's floating freely in the liquor. Go ahead and enjoy it. Mmm. So good. A little bit salty, a little sweet. Super better. Give it some, some chews. Mmm. That's a release of the flavor. And I always like to have a little plate with crushed ice. If I didn't eat that one, go ahead and plate the oyster on the bed of crushed ice. It makes for a nice presentation and keeps it cold until you're ready to eat it. But anyway, that's basically it. Happy shucking and, uh, you know, shuck safely. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you, Scott. That's incredible. I mean, of course, you make it look so easy. Uh, we will all give it a try uh, and do it just as you have instructed, but that's terrific. Um, and we really appreciate, Scott, uh, all that you do and uh, that wonderful shucking lesson. So we want to also thank our sponsor, and it's a longtime BMI supporter, Pompeian, the olive oil people. They are making this portion of the evening possible. So check out the chat and you can get a link to uh, recipes from the olive oil people are good friends at Pompeii, and we are grateful to them for supporting this event and for supporting the BMI. Now, for those of you who ordered oysters from Orchard Point Oyster Farm this evening, um, I hope you did follow along and uh, tried to shuck them yourself. Um, so we'll see uh, how that went if you tell us about it in the chat. So remember, you can always use the chat to weigh in and say hi and uh, let us know how things go when you try some of the things that we're suggesting tonight. So use the chat for that. And don't forget, of course, to bid on the commemorative shucking knife. That's part of our online auction and it's donated by the Oyster Recovery Partnership. So uh, check out that commemorative shucking knife and all the other great things that are uh, 
available in the online auction. So now that we are all complete pros at shucking oysters, um, we need to know what to do with our freshly shucked oysters. And if you want to cook them, one easy way is to put them on the grill. So to show us how that is done, here's Chef Matt. He's from Zeffert and Gold Catering. Chef Matt, give us a little tip, give us some tips on grilling our oysters. Hi, I'm Chef Matt from Zeffert and Gold Catering. I'm gonna be doing a grilled oyster demo for the BMI Bull Roast. Today we're gonna to go over a few different grilled oyster recipes. We're gonna go over a classic garlic Parmesan butter, a little bit of parsley, breadcrumb, and slap your mama seasoning. Next, we're gonna do a buffalo blue cheese oyster with a little bit of celery on top. And last, a Maryland grilled oyster, of course, because we are in Maryland. A Bloody Mary with some Old Bay cilantro finished with a little bit of fresh lemon juice. After we put together the sauces, we're gonna go over some grilling techniques and how to finish things and plate them so they look beautiful. The first sauce we're gonna work on is the garlic Parmesan butter. Now this is a very similar recipe to the famous grilled oysters of New Orleans. First, we're gonna take one stick of melted butter, mix in one tablespoon of minced garlic, two tablespoons of shredded Parmesan cheese, one teaspoon of parsley flakes, and we're gonna reserve the Slap Your Mama seasoning and panko breadcrumbs for the garnish. Next up is the Buffalo Blue Cheese Oyster. We'll take four ounces of your favorite hot sauce, that could be Tabasco, Crystal, or Red's Hot, and then we're gonna mix in two ounces of melted butter. We're gonna set the celery and the blue cheese off to the side for grilling. Last but not least, the Maryland Bloody Mary Oyster. We're gonna take four ounces of your favorite Bloody Mary mix. We're gonna mix in one tablespoon of Old Bay, and we're gonna save the lemon juice and the cilantro for the garnish. So a few things to keep in mind when grilling oysters is you wanna have your grill on a medium to high heat. You wanna make sure that the heat of the grill is gonna penetrate through the shell of the oyster. I typically look for the liquid inside of the shell to start bubbling around the edges of the oyster to let me know that the oyster is done. That also helps when you're adding things like garlic butter, you'll see everything in the shell nice and bubbly. So the first we're gonna grill is the Parmesan butter. Now, now that the sauce is mixed together, we're gonna make sure that everything is stirred together right before you decide to spoon a little bit, about one teaspoon of the garlic Parmesan butter onto each oyster. Once the garlic Parmesan butter is on each oyster, we're gonna place them on the grill, oyster side up, for about three to four minutes. Once things start to get bubbly and delicious, we're gonna take the slap your mama seasoning and the panko breadcrumbs, we're gonna sprinkle that on top and give it about one more minute and we'll pull them off. So when grilling the buffalo blue cheese oyster, we're actually gonna start with the blue cheese crumbles. You're gonna sprinkle a little bit of blue cheese on top of each oyster, and then we'll finish with one teaspoon of hot sauce butter mixture per oyster, and we'll throw that right on the grill. Give that a few minutes, let the cheese start to melt, the sauce will start bubbling, and then one minute before you pull it off the grill, we'll finish with the minced celery. The Maryland Bloody Mary grilled oysters are very similar to the garlic parmesan butter. We're gonna take about one teaspoon of the Bloody Mary mix. We're gonna put that on top of each oyster and get those onto the grill. Give those about three to four minutes until they start to bubble. We'll finish with the chopped cilantro and the fresh lemon juice, and we're good to go. Now, before you enjoy your grilled oysters, be very careful, the shell is going to be extremely hot. Give them a few minutes to cool down and enjoy with a fork or give yourself a few more minutes and feel free to slurp them right out of the shell. Thanks for watching the Zephyr and Gold Grilled Oyster Demo. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the BMI Bull Roast. And thank you, Matt, that is terrific. My gosh, does that stuff look good or what? I can't wait to try out all those different sauces. Fantastic to mix and match and you know have them uh, for yourself and your guests. Uh, uh, you could just, you know, have a, this wonderful buffet of different kinds of grilled oysters. So thanks again to Chef Matt and to all of our friends at Zephyr and Gold. They have for a long time provided the delicious catering for the BMI's bull and oyster roasts. Back in the day when we were on site, we will be on site again 
keep keep the faith, folks. Uh, there there is a, a new day, a, a coming, a new dawn, a dawning. Um, so we appreciate again that everybody's joined us online this year, and we look forward to joining everybody in person next year. We also want to thank uh, our program sponsor, Tolkoff Food Products. Fresh shucked oysters just aren't complete without plenty of Tolkoff horseradish and cocktail sauce. So you can see in the chat uh, the link to the great things that Tolkoff Food Products sell for us. And again, we are very, very grateful to them for being a of the BMI. Um, you know, while today's oysters are prized as a gourmet delicacy, um, it's hard to believe that they once caused gun battles on the Chesapeake Bay. You know, when I first heard about this particular presentation we're about to watch, I was intrigued that something as you know, seemingly mundane as an oyster could instigate a war. But in fact, uh, there's a story there. And BMI, of course, is all about telling great stories. So to tell us this story, Kate Libby, she's an author, an educator, an historian, and an expert on all things Chesapeake Bay and oysters. So Katie, or Kate, take it away. Hey guys, my name is Kate Libby. I am the uh, author of Chesapeake Oysters, the Bay's Foundation and Future. And I'm here to tell you all about the Oyster Wars, uh, a really fascinating chapter in Maryland and Chesapeake history that I bet you didn't know anything about. So sit back, hopefully throw back a few oysters and a cold beer and let me tell you a little story about the Oyster Wars. So hang on one second and I'm gonna get my uh, presentation up. Okay. So, little background. Um, this is all taking place immediately after the Civil War, but before the turn of the century. So this is an incredible time of innovation and transformation in the Chesapeake Bay, all because of technology. Um, you know, really around like the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, there was oystering in the Chesapeake. There'd been oystering for millennia, but there was no way to preserve oysters or really get them anywhere. Um, we didn't have any methods to preserve oysters besides pickling, which I do not recommend. Um, although George Washington really liked it. So what happens is the new technology of canning is introduced to America from the French, and then it goes to New York, and it's brought to Baltimore by New York uh, oyster interests who are interested in accessing the very bountiful oysters of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and this happens at the perfect time because, lo and behold, uh, Baltimore has also developed the new technology of railroads. So add that with these incredibly sort of plentiful oyster stocks and this other technology that came from New England, these big oyster dredge boats, and you got what creates what we call the oyster boom. All right, so let's talk about the oyster boom and how it created the oyster wars. Okay, so in this image, you can see, you know, these fleet of skipjacks. And imagine the fleets of skipjacks and bug eyes um, and other really large sailing bateaux that are har out harvesting oysters and bringing them into, you know, huge packing plants, not just in Baltimore, but in Solomon's, in Cambridge, in St. Michael's, in Oxford, um, in Crisfield, all over the Chesapeake, you know, the, the industry around the oyster uh, industry is really booming and exploding. Um, and of course, if you've been to the BMI, then you've seen some of the exhibits there uh, that talk about these sort of industrial packing facilities and how they hired immigrant workers or they hired recently emancipated African Americans. And, you know, this is, you had towns like Crisfield that it was like literally built on oyster shells. And so this, there's so much money to make in this time period that, you know, as you can imagine, there's just, it's opportune for conflict. You know, there's just tons and tons of money. If you can get out there, if you can oyster, then you can make a mint and you could make a fortune. Now the state had attempted to regulate the oystering industry when in 1865, right after the civil war, it, you know, set up a whole licensing system. So you have all these 
you know, people coming back from the Civil War. This is a way to have jobs, but they wanted to set up some type of regulation. And the idea was that they wanted to protect shallow waters for Tongers. And Tongers are the people in the in the left hand photo. So they're going out in smaller boats. They're harvesting, you know, 20 bushels of oysters a day. It's a much smaller venture. And largely, this is something that's done by poorer people or by African Americans who were often prevented from getting loans to get bigger boats. Now, on the right hand side, we have an image of an oyster dredge being used on a skipjack or a bug eye, a really large oyster fishing vessel. And these uh, bug eyes and skipjacks, they had to use what was known as sort of county waters or state waters. Um, state waters were specifically, it's deeper water, you know, where you could go out and harvest more oysters. But then county waters were to be limited to only tongers with the idea that, you know, they would have shallow water oysters available to them within reach of their tongs. The problem is, is that A, oysters were worth so much money and you could make, you know, so much money off of them. And to get to the deeper water, you had to get over the shallower water. So there's going over those county waters. If you were a dredger, you might drop your dredge and then you might do it more regularly. And then somebody else sees you doing it and they start doing it. And so what you have is basically, and the initial conflict is not between regulators and, and you know, oystermen, it's between oystermen versus oystermen. What happens is these tongers are like, hey, those are our oysters. And they start, you know, getting rifles and shotguns and taking pot shots whenever they see these skipjacks, especially skip skipjack captains would go out at night. These oystermen would go out at night to harvest under the cloak of darkness so that they could go out and harvest as many oysters as they wanted. So you had these gun battles breaking out of all these like, you know, not just Baltimore, but all over the Chester River and the Chop Tank River and the Potomac and anywhere that you had these like big oyster populations, you had immediate conflict. And so this conflict is happening so much that it starts getting picked up in national headlines. Um, and they're not, you know, if you think like, okay, okay, oyster poachers, you know, that's, that's not so great. Now, if you're a newspaper man, you're like, I want to sell newspapers. How do I do it? These are oyster pirates and the conflict it's not just you know inter oystermen conflict it's the oyster wars and so this that starts getting picked up by national level newspapers across the united states what to do about it so in 1865 when they set up all these regulations the idea was they were all supposed to be enforced by one one body that's called the state fishery force which would become known as the oyster navy and on the right hand side this is hunter davidson he is the head of the maryland oyster navy the state fishery force and he has it as a wit's end it's gotten so bad with the conflicts between a lot of these you know individual oystermen and, and smaller vessels and larger vessels that the state fishery force has gotten involved and what happens then well then the oystermen retaliate against the state fishery force especially the captains of these larger vessels that were going out and harvesting illegally in the shallower waters. They had also started to devise some of these new techniques where oystermen would work together in these large bands of pirates and they would sit at the mouths of waterways so that a couple could go out at a time and keep a lookout while the rest of them were further up the river and harvesting as many oysters as they wanted. So if a state fishery force steamer happened to come up the river, then they would alert all the other ones. And then the ones that were keeping watch might, you know, start take opening fire at the state fishery force. So that, the, and they only really had a couple vessels to begin with. So Hunter Davidson in 1877 goes in front of the state legislature to beg for more vessels, to beg for more support, more crew, more people to be out there managing these lawless fisheries that were just, you know, you, people were getting killed every day. Gun battles were breaking out all the time. And it's, you know, there were casualties of these, you know, this bitter conflict. So he ends up um, in this time period actually uh, lobbying for and getting um, a bunch of new vessels, including the McLean, a vessel, a steamer um, that now is, you know, off the, the water, the water line there at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. So he's successful. But one of his first conflicts is in 1877 on the Chester River. And what happens is, and this is such a great story. So there's one guy, Gus Rice, who's the head of this 
band of oyster pirates and he's notorious he's a fighter he's a brawler and you know he's always looking for a loophole so he's there at the mouth of the chester river and he's waiting for the state fishery force and he sees a steamer coming up the river and so he and his band of pirates just open fire on this thing it turns out it's just a passenger steamer full of women and children and they're screaming and crying and you know they're hitting the deck and uh, he realizes he made his mistake, but it was too late. And the news gets back to Hunter Davidson, who decides that he's going to send the McLean out to deal with this issue. And so he sends a McLean out. And as you can see in some of these images, it's, you know, it's nighttime and they're headed up the Chester River and they come into this band. It's a, it's a rafted up uh, entire sort of floating flotilla of, of skipjacks and bug eyes and oyster boats. And they've got metal plates on the, the bow of their ships all connected with the idea that every, you know, all the crew could get hunkered down behind these metal plates with their rifles and their shotguns and they start opening fire on the McLean. The McLean, of course, is, is armed with a howitzer. So, and it's not afraid of some, you know, small wooden skipjacks. So what they end up doing is they just open her up full steam ahead. She just plows right into this, you know, this entire rafted up flotilla of vessels. And almost immediately, one of them, the Mahoney, sinks. And so the Mahoney's sinking, and all the crew on the Mahoney are like jumping off and they're trying to get onto the steamer, and the steamer is not having it. The McLean backs up and goes full steam ahead again and rams into the, the, the flotilla a second time. And again, it's just all hell breaks loose. And you know, you have crew swimming away, and it turns out that later on that there's a bunch of Shanghai crew that had been, you know found drunk in a bar and they stuffed them into the hold of one of these skipjacks to impress them as you know to work on board as oystermen for later and maybe not get paid and maybe drown um and what happens is they all drown in the hold at the ship that sunk and so that's just one example of the types of conflicts that happen over and over and over and you're you're looking at these these newspaper headlines from all around the country and you know people are opening up their newspapers in the morning um you know in new york and chicago and baltimore and washington reading all about these headlines and they're accompanied with images like this this could be of the mclean um and it's showing that nighttime gun battle that you'd see happening on the waterways of the chesapeake now why don't we hear about the oyster wars anymore well, largely it's because at the turn of the 19th century, the oyster population started to drop precipitously because of overharvesting. And it, this was really a time period when there was so little regulation, you could, well, besides the oyster, you know, the state fishery force, you could harvest almost as much as you wanted. Um, this also happened at a time period when the oyster population starts to drop, but new technology like refrigeration makes it easier to catch crabs instead of only oysters or also fish instead of just oysters. So this is a time period when oystermen become watermen and the fishery becomes more diversified. And so there's less pressure to go out and shoot and kill to get as much access as oyst to oysters as you, know, as you want. Um, now that you have the ability to go out and harvest something else to make money. So just as a side note, what ends up happening to the McLean. So the McLean goes on and is used in the Oyster Navy up until World War I, when it's pressed into service as a uh, Coast Guard vessel um, during you know, World War I for the US government. Um, after that, um, the vessel ends up working out of the Chesapeake again and spends the, her last days there uh, docked at the um, BMI bulkhead and you can see what remains of her today, um, the last remnant from the shadows of the Oyster Wars of the Chesapeake. So thank you so much for listening today. I hope you learned a little bit. If you wanna read more stories, you can always check out my book, uh, Chesapeake Oysters, The Bay's Foundation and Future. Um, I really enjoyed telling you all about the uh, wild and wooly adventures on the Chester River where I live. Um, and thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your uh, bull and oyster roast. Well, thank you, Kate. That is fascinating. There's just so much uh, that goes into this rich history of oysters in the Chesapeake and on the Chesapeake Bay. And I love how Kate, you know, incorporates all of the different aspects of this story. Um, it had to do with transportation and the development of the, uh, the railroads. It had to do with manufacturing. 
uh, and the fact that they figured out how to mass manufacture cans. Um, it had to do with the press. You know, uh, if it bleeds, it leads uh, was something that was apparently a dictum of the press even back in the 19th century. It had to do with state politics and regulation and all sorts of stuff coming together to tell an incredible story and to make an incredible and rich history. Uh, storytelling, of course, is what the BMI does so beautifully. Uh, and that great story that Kate just told him, by the way, um, you can win a copy of Kate's book in the raffle. So check the raffle out uh, and you will uh, have a chance to win a copy of Kate's wonderful book that goes into even more detail about this rich history. Um, but again, you know, preserving the stories from our past, uh, sharing them in ways that are memorable. Um, this is a particular skill. This is not something that comes easily. It's something that takes a lot of study, a lot of work, a lot of thought. Uh, and that is what is so magical about the BMI's educational programs. Uh, the museum's efforts are helped by our next program sponsor, Direct Dimensions. And we are grateful to Direct Dimensions. In addition to supporting this evening's event, uh, Direct Dimensions has been creating 3D scans of all of the artifacts at the BMI. Isn't that amazing? They're scanning these things on these 3D scanners and creating scans of all of these artifacts, including lots of the stuff that's in the kids' cannery uh, to help the stories of the past literally come alive through virtual learning programs. You know, this past year, uh, BMI, like everybody else, has had to adopt and uh, adapt to this, you know, terrible pandemic situation. Um, the award-winning programs that meet the needs of teachers and students uh, had to be recalibrated so that they could meet these very, very important needs of teachers and students when they're not able to visit and come in person. Of course, the BMI hosts just hundreds and hundreds of school groups every year. This year, kids couldn't come to the museum itself, but the storytellers at the BMI figured out how to get to the kids virtually. So here to tell us a little bit more about the BMI education uh, effort and the education program is the BMI's education manager, Jessica Selmer. Jessica, welcome. The Baltimore Museum of Industry celebrates the dignity of work. Our programs and activities highlight such issues as workers' rights and workplace equity, providing historical context for contemporary issues that impact our community. At the BMI, students learn about jobs and work that are important to Baltimore's history as an industrial city. They learn about the themes of immigration, changing technology, skilled and unskilled work, and segregated labor, with a deep dive into canning, printing, and garment industries. In response to the pandemic, the BMI took the initiative to recreate the learning kids would typically have on site at the museum into virtual tours and box activity kits that could be experienced from the safety of home. Our virtual field trips offer students a live guided tour of the museum and include interactive lessons and printable activity packets they can download to round out their experience. City kits are all-in-one activity boxes that provide kids with the tools they need to engage in the best elements of our on-site programs. Each activity kit includes hands-on, curriculum-aligned activities accompanied by easy-to-follow lesson plans. Participants in city kits can choose from two different activity boxes. The first is inspired by our kids' cannery program and asks students to think about the different types of work involved in the process of preparing, preserving, and providing food for communities. This kit allows students to explore primary source images, build their own vegetable can, and flex their math skills through the steps to build a canning business. The second city kit is based on our Lights On program and encourages students to think about how light helps us to see and communicate. In this STEM activity kit, students explore several methods for communicating with light and sound, test their skills using Morse code, 
and create their own light communication device from the box of this activity kit. We partnered with Baltimore City Public Schools and Great Kids Farm to advise on the creation and distribution of the box activity kits. The guidance of these partners was key in making sure that the kits were aligned, accessible, and available to as many students as possible. The initial 2,000 kits were assembled at the BMI this past spring and handed out free to students in Baltimore City at meal distribution sites. Two BMI trustees, Len the Plumber, CEO Jeff Cooper, and Tolkoff Food Products President Phil Tolkoff helped the initiative by providing the use of company trucks to help in the distribution effort. While serving our community with city kits and virtual tours, we are also looking forward. The innovations of the past year have given us new tools we can adopt to support teachers and students beyond the pandemic. But we rely on you and your support to do so. Your gifts fund the development of these innovations and give kids new opportunities to learn about Baltimore's industrial history and the hardworking people who are part of that story. Thank you to all of you that have donated to tonight's event. You are making it possible to inspire the inventors and innovators of tomorrow. Thank you, Jessica, that's just terrific. I mean, the initial run of these incredible kits for the kids was 2000. That was just where they started. I mean, it's amazing to think that the BMI uh, has done such incredible work staying connected to the community, staying connected to the children uh, and making sure that the children uh, don't lose opportunities to take advantage of all the great things that are going on at the BMI, even though they have to do it virtually. Um, but that's amazing that the variety, the, the different uh, approaches to having the kids have a wonderful experience courtesy of the BMI. They've, they've just thought of everything, it seems. I mean, it's just, it's so impressive. And of course, that's why we're all here tonight. We're here because these education programs that the Baltimore Museum of Industry does are so, so vital and so important for the children in our community and throughout our state. So uh, bravo to the education department at the BMI for all the great work you're doing. And our next guest uh, can tell you about the power of these student programs from the BMI, uh, from empirical first person experience. I'm delighted to introduce Chelsea Payardo. She is the community school coordinator from Bel Air Edison's Elementary School. So Chelsea, welcome. Hi everybody, my name is Chelsea Fajardo. I am the Community School Coordinator over at the Bel Air Edison School Brems Campus, where we serve pre-K to fifth graders. Back when I was a classroom teacher for third grade, we had the amazing opportunity to actually visit the museum with our third graders. Um, they got to walk through the museum and get to learn about it in addition to being on the assembly line. So they had such a great time that I knew when I, become a, when I became a community school coordinator that I also wanted to open up that opportunity to all of our grade levels. And so that is exactly what we did. <laughs> So over the past year, uh, we, as you know, COVID happened, right? So on March 13th of last year, we shut our schools down. And so, well, we shut our schools down for in-person learning. However, we did continue virtually. And during the fall of 2020, we still started the school year off virtually, but BMI was so gracious. You all were so gracious enough to program with me some virtual learning extensions or AKA virtual field trips. And so, Every week from the second week of September on, our students have had access to visiting places like BMI. Uh, although it was virtual, they still had such a great time. So they got on, they got to hear the history of the museum, they got to do a tour with the um, you know, curator. It was an amazing time. They got to ask questions. And although our students this year couldn't physically be at BMI, they still got a great time to see what it would be like and many expressed afterwards that they want to go so we cannot wait until you know COVID restrictions are lifted to bring them by. Um, BMI has also given us 100 first grade STEM kits so every one of our first graders was able to receive a STEM kit which they could take home and do with their families and that was just another great way to engage with BMI. 
things I love about BMI and their staff is that they are so passionate about the work. Um, you know, between everyone there, I just can't get enough of hearing from my students about how much fun that they've had with your organization. If you're here today joining the event, please make sure you check in with BMI to see how you can help their future events. We want to continue their amazing work. And the only way we can do that is by getting more donations and more sponsorships. So thank you so much. Oh, Chelsea, thank you so much. I mean, isn't it incredible, even in a video, this dedicated, wonderful educator just exudes such enthusiasm, such inspiration, such compassion. And clearly, uh, the BMI is a big, big part of the work that she and her colleagues at Beller Edison are doing. So um, it's just fantastic. I mean, if I'd had Ms. Payardo in the third grade, uh, a teacher that enthusias enthusiastic and inspiring, I mean, Lord knows I could have made something of myself perhaps. I mean, it's just fantastic uh, to hear how much the BMI is valued as a community resource. Um, and it's really great, think about this, it is great to know that all of us are here doing what we can that will allow even more teachers like Chelsea to connect their students to the great programs at the BMI. So that's again, the whole purpose of us gathering tonight on this virtual fundraiser. And again, we are delighted that you're all here joining us. We want to express our appreciation to the Novak family for sponsoring this portion of our program. And for them, uh, the Novaks being such enthusiastic ambassadors for the BMI's educational program. So don't forget to show your support too. You can bid in tonight's auction or you can buy raffle tickets and the raffle and the auction are gonna finish at eight o'clock sharp. So we've got about 12 more minutes before the auction and raffle stop. So make sure you've made a bid uh, and uh, bid early and bid often and bid as high as you can because it all goes to help the great education programs at the BMI. So now we're gonna have another chef demo. These are always fun. Uh, we will get some more ideas for some tasty oyster dishes. We're now gonna welcome Dylan Salmon. He's the owner of Dylan's Oyster Cellar in Hamden and he's gonna share a recipe with a terrific history. Hi, this is Dylan Salmon at Dylan's Oyster Cellar, and we were happy to team up with the Baltimore Museum of Industry on this project. I know that the BMI is housed in an old oyster shucking factory, um, an oyster cannery, and I know that those used to uh, dot the Baltimore shoreline, the Inner Harbor area, um, and at one point was one of the main professions for Baltimoreans was shucking oysters for canning. They would get canned and shipped out west, uh, up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, it was a healthy, easy or er, easy protein. Um, and here at Dillon's Oyster Cellar, we shuck a lot of Chesapeake oysters still to this day. Um, I'd say about 50% of all the oysters we shuck are from the Chesapeake region, Maryland, Virginia. Um, and Today we featured an oyster pan roast, which is a very traditional historic dish. Um, I think in a couple of times I had mentioned its uh, popularity up in New York, but it was also a popular dish up and down the eastern seaboard, you know, primarily New York, Boston, um, and Baltimore, and, uh, you know, other urban areas on the east coast. Um, I know that at one point there were uh, oyster pan roast stalls out on the streets. I've seen some drawings, some uh, illustrations of, you know, people huddled around as guys roasted up oysters to order. Um, I would imagine kind of something like uh, what you see today with lobster roll carts and stuff like that. Uh, but this is a really traditional dish that I thought kind of a lot of people don't know about and would be fun to highlight. It's super easy to prepare at home and delicious. So I hope you all enjoy. And uh, again, it's our pleasure to partner up and help the BMI um, from Dylan's Oyster Cellar. Keep up your good work, guys. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Let's cook an oyster pan roast. What do you guys say? 
All right, so the oyster pan roast is a uh, dish that was popular back in the 1800s, but they still cook it today. Um, this is a dish that is pretty much just oysters roasted in butter in a pan. Um, and it can be just that simple, but it's usually elaborated on. Uh, the oysters are poured over toast when they're finished and usually fortified with chili, uh, chili sauce, some celery salt, paprika, a little bit of half and half, Worcestershire. Um, all of that is kind of cooked into a thick stew and then that's poured over the toast. That's kind of the classic version that people know of. Um, and today I shucked some blue points fresh for the dish. I think they are the perfect oyster for it because they're not too big, not too small, and they have a good amount of brine. Um, they cook up very nicely for it. So without further ado, let's cook the dish. So we're gonna start with a pan, kind of medium high heat start with a good maybe tablespoon of butter let that start melting in the pan okay once your butter is melted we add a little bit of clam juice clam juice will add some salinity also some flavor some brothiness we'll let that reduce a little bit and I like to add a little bit of the oyster liquor as well Okay, so as that's reducing, I'm going to make sure I'm ready to prepare the dish. Once the oysters hit the pan, they cook pretty fast. So this dish should take maybe three minutes tops to cook. It's a quick dish. Okay, so we're looking good and hot here. I've turned up the heat, kind of medium high, I would say. And I'm going to begin to cook the oysters. I will take them out of their liquor. You can reserve that for later use or to pitch it. So the oysters hit the pan. Put them in there as quick as possible. And once they're in the pan, you start adding your seasonings. So we're gonna add a pinch of paprika. We're gonna add a pinch of celery salt. We're gonna add some Worcestershire sauce. Kind of rounds out some of the brine and a little bit of chili sauce. I'm using sriracha. Finally, fresh cracked pepper. Okay, the oysters are now seasoned up. I'm gonna flip them. You can see the edges starting to curl up. That's a sign that they're cooking through. I'm gonna flip these guys over. Get that seasoning all worked out. All right, oysters look like they're pretty ready. At this point, I can add the cream. In this case, half and half. Add a little half and half. All right, and turn the heat down a little bit. You can bring the half and half up to temp. You don't want to break it though. If you cook it too hard, you can break the cream. Okay, as this comes up, the dish is pretty much done. We will go over plating. So for plating, I take a bowl, Put a piece of toast in the middle and begin by spooning a few oysters over the toast. And then pouring the juice on top. We're going to finish this with a pinch of paprika and cracked pepper. And that is the dish, the oyster pan roast. Hooray! Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. And by the way, we will post all of these recipes that we're hearing tonight on the BMI website after the event. So uh, fear not, we will make sure that you can get them. But thank you, Dylan, for walking us through that particular uh, iconic recipe. Uh, and for those of you uh, who are looking for to have somebody else like Dylan cook oysters for you, uh, we can't recommend enough Dylan's curbside pickup menu. So that'll be posted uh, on the chat. Check them up. Check them out. Uh, Dylan's place over in Hamden. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and hopefully uh, everybody has had a chance to eat their fill of oysters tonight. And our next guest is going to 
show us what happens after the oyster shells leave our plate and how they are used to ensure the health of the bay and to sustain Maryland's oyster industry. So please welcome Karis King from Oyster Recovery Partnership. Karis, take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Karis King from Oyster Recovery Partnership, the leading nonprofit working to restore oysters to the Chesapeake Bay. A huge thank you to our friends at the Baltimore Museum of Industry for giving us a platform to talk about our favorite thing, oysters. Oysters are important because in addition to being delicious, they're incredible filter feeders. Just one oyster can clean up to 50 gallons of water per day. So you can imagine the benefit of millions of oysters over thousands of underwater acres. Plus the reefs provide critical habitat for crabs, fish, mussels, and other marine life. Over time, populations have dropped to historically low levels due to poor water quality, oyster disease, and overharvesting. Here at ORP, our goal is to bring oysters back to levels they were hundreds of years ago. When Captain John Smith described oysters the size of dinner plates, when ships had to navigate around oyster reefs because they were so tall and abundant, they were considered a navigational hazard. In 2009, we began the large scale work that we know today, and we've accomplished a lot since this time. ORP has planted 9 billion oysters in the bay on over 2,600 underwater acres. And we've recycled hundreds of thousands of bushels of shell thanks to our restaurant partners and individuals like you. Shell recycling and restoration actually go hand in hand because shell is critical to rebuilding oyster reefs. Without it, we just can't operate, which is why we work day in and day out to save shell from area restaurants and public drop sites. So be sure to recycle your shell this evening. From shell recycling, transport, washing, and seeding, the oyster restoration process features many steps and many partners, including the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Horn Point Oyster Hatchery, NOAA, the Army Corps of Engineers, and partners like you. In this video, you'll see the journey a shell takes once it's eaten, from plate to reef.
Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope you learned a little something and found the video helpful in understanding the shower cycling process. Please continue to enjoy oysters. Many are sustainably grown and harvested and each shell is used to create an oyster reef. For more information on our work and how you can get involved, visit oysterrecovery.org. Well, thank you, Karis. That's terrific. Just pack full of really, really interesting information. We had a question uh, on the chat uh, about posting the shell drop-off sites, and I'm sure we'll be able to do that after the event. That's a really good idea. The uh, raffle and the auction have closed now. We are going to be uh, announcing the winners of uh, two of the big items in the, uh, in the auction, uh, and then the rest of them, uh, the winners will be notified by folks from the BMI staff a little bit later. So hang on for that. But before we do that, we want to, again, thank Karis for all the work, uh, the important work that they do at the Oyster Recovery Partnership. Um, and we want to test our own knowledge of all things oyster. So we're going to have uh, some true or false questions that you get to vote on, right? So uh, I'll pose the question and we'll take a little poll and we'll see uh, how all of us think uh, things go in the world of oysters what we know, what we may be surprised to learn, uh, and what we will find out in the process. So this is uh, a, part for, a part of the evening's festivities for you all to be involved, right? So here's our first question in our oyster poll. Oysters can change from male to female or from female to male. Is that true or false? Right, so click on whether you think that's true, that oysters can change from male to female or back from female to male, right? What do you think? We'll take a little poll. We'll find out what most of us think one way or the other. And then of course we will divulge the answer, right? So 83% of us think that in fact, oysters can change from male to female or from female to male, and the answer, weirdly enough, is true. So oysters do begin their lives as males, but they can't, or they can rather, change their sex from male to female and female to male many times over a lifetime. So uh, that's one of the great tricks that oysters have, uh, and that's terrific to know. So here's question number two, again, uh, weigh in, what do you think? True or false? You can tell an oyster's sex by looking at its shell. What do you think? Is that possible? You can tell an oyster's sex by looking at its shell. So pick your answer, true or false. Do you think you can do that by just checking out the shell and from just that observation, can you tell what an oyster's sex is? All right, let's see how we came out with this in terms of the folks who are on this wonderful Zoom call. Most of us, 84% of us, think it's false. Uh, and male and female oysters uh, do look alike. The only way to, to tell them apart is to actually sample its gonad and examine it microscopically. Or you can watch it spawn as males and females do behave differently during a spawning event. But who wants to do that? None of us. But no, it is false, right? So you cannot tell an oyster's sex by looking at the shell. You've got to get a whole lot more involved in order to figure that out. All right, third question, true or false? Oysters are only found in shallow water. What do you think? I'll give you a second, choose your answer, true or false. You can find oysters only in shallow water, right? Let's think, let's see where we come down on that. Most of us think that is not true, right? And is it in fact not true? It is false, right? Oysters can survive in deep water if 
conditions allow. However, most Chesapeake Bay oysters are found in shallow waters due to the lack of oxygen in deeper waters. All right, so can go both ways, deep water, shallow water, but most of them in the bay are found in the shallow waters. Here's another question for you. This is a fun one. True or false, oysters have feet which they use to move around. Hmm. Oysters have feet. What do you think? True or false? Do oysters have feet? Do they have feet that they can use to move around? So weigh in, let us know what you think, and let's see what most of us think. Interesting. Do they have feet? Most people say, nope, 68% of us, but 32% of us do think that oysters have feet. And as it turns out, they're right. It is true for a brief period of time, at the end of the larval period, oysters do develop an appendage called a foot, which they use to crawl and cement themselves to hard surfaces to become a spat, which we heard about uh, in the video that Karis shared with us a minute ago. So interesting, true oysters do for a little while have feet. All right, next question, true or false? Oysters cannot survive out of water, right? So the terra firma life of an oyster. Can you survive if you're an oyster and you are out of water? What do you think, true or false? They cannot survive out of water. Is that true or is that false? What do you think? Weigh in and here's what most folks think. Most folks think it is false. Although 40% thought maybe, yeah, they could, they are in fact mistaken in this regard. It is false. Oysters can survive out of water for a few hours or even days if the conditions are right. So in some areas, they are commonly exposed to air during low tide, right? So, uh, you know, they can do it if they have to. So how did everybody do? We, we have Oyster experts in the audience, I bet we do. I know we have a lot of oyster lovers in the audience, that's for sure. So um, if you got all five answers right, let us know in the chat. That'll be fun. We will celebrate you with our own little uh, personal applause in each of our, our Zoom rooms here. Uh, so now we are going to announce the winners of the auction and the raffle. So, First of all, I want to thank everybody who has participated uh, in the auction. Uh, all of you who bought raffle tickets, I really appreciate it. You are supporting a great cause. And we want to thank the people who donated the items to the auction. Uh, Alan Sow, Brad Spring, Charlie Barton, Nelson Coleman Jewelers, the Oyster Recovery Project. These are all great folks. Uh, Getz's Candy Company, ASR Domino Sugar, and Pompeian, the olive oil people, they all donated stuff to our auction. And we are very, very grateful to them for the items that they donated. We also want to thank our auction sponsors, Scott and Amy Enser. The auction is closed. It closed about 11 minutes ago or so. The BMI staff will be following up with the auction winners to arrange pickup and shipping of the stuff that you were the winner of. Um, but before we close out the evening tonight, I'm going to announce the winners of our two signature raffle items. The diamond, which was generously donated by Nelson Coleman Jewelers, and the Wagon of Cheer, which was sponsored by the Propeller Club of Baltimore. So I am... Uh, hopefully going to find the winner of these two uh, items magically appear on my phone. And in fact, they have. So the winner of the Wagon of Cheer, Chris Better. Chris, congratulations. You are the winner of the Wagon of Cheer and the winner of the Diamond from Nelson Coleman Jewelers. Keith Taylor, congratulations, Keith. You are the winner of the Nelson Coleman Jewelers Diamond. So congratulations to everybody. 
Uh, we are all winners tonight because we are all here for a good cause. I'm going to turn it now back to Nan. Nan, take it away. Tom, first off, an amazing thank you to you for being our MC this evening, for making this as fun as we can possibly make it from a distance, as we all know we want to be back in person, hopefully again next year, but thank you um, for really helping us create an enjoyable and memorable evening. Thank all of you as well for joining us this evening and for all that you do in so many ways to support the BMI. Your generosity means so much, especially now and over this past year. To our event sponsors and partners, thank you for your many contributions to this evening's event. We are going to close out this evening's festivities with some music by a classic case. But before we go, I'd like my website. Thank you all. Have a great night and be well.